everyone to the 2020 Steve and Sylvia Burgess Endowed Lecture. Uh, thank you all for coming. We have a wonderful turnout this afternoon. This lecture is intended to provide us with an opportunity to hear from distinguished civil and environmental engineers and learn about what these men and women are doing to meet some of the engineering challenges of our time. Uh, before we get started with my introduction, um, I'd like to take the t opportunity to say thank you very much to Steve and Sylvia Burgess. Uh, Steve is a CEE Professor Emeritus and Sylvia is a CEE alum and we are very grateful for their support of this lecture and their continued support of the department. So thank you very much. This afternoon, we're going to hear from Professor Dorothy Reed. Uh, during Dorothy's career, she has developed expertise in a broad range of civil uh, engineering topics. It took me a while to list them all. Wind engineering, stochiastic processes, risk and reliability assessment, network and systems analysis, as well as more recently, indoor air quality, ener energy use and storage in buildings, and perhaps for a number of years now, the design of wood structures. She's employed this expertise to make significant contributions to the design of components, buildings, and systems for wind loading, um, including um, a lot of work focused on cladding systems and the design of some uh, supplemental damping systems for wind loading so you don't get sick when you go to the top of that really tall building. Um, Additionally, she served in multiple leadership roles within the ASCE Wind Engineering Division. So certainly wind engineering has been a huge part of her career. Um, she's also recently, though, been using some of uh, her understanding of uh, statistics and stochiastic processes, natural hazard engineering, to look at the interdependencies of civil and uh, infrastructure systems like the electrical grid, the water grid, transportation, um, and other types of systems that enable us to live our daily lives and our cities to function. Um, in particular, recently, she's been collaborating with uh, and is part of the $20 million NIST-funded Center of Excellence for Risk-Based Community Resilience and Planning at Colorado State University. And her contributions, no doubt, have helped the success or led to the success of the center, which very recently they announced was going to be funded for a second round. So we're very excited to have somebody here that is working at that national, international level, looking at one of the really challenging problems of natural hazard engineering, the idea of the interdependence of these vast networks that make up our cities. And with that, I will leave it to uh, ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Reed. In late September of 2005, a group of doctors and nurses euthanized eight patients at Memorial Hospital located in New Orleans, Louisiana. And then they went home. This is a picture of Memorial, and you can see that there's a circular parking garage there. There is some flooding, but the buildings remain intact. Ten days after the doctors left, there was a cleanup crew that went in, and they found a total of 45 dead bodies strewn throughout the hospital. What happened? Sherry Fink wrote a book entitled Five Days at Memorial, won the Pulitzer Prize in 2013. And she details the things that went on at that hospital. 
there was generator failure. There were no lights, there was no air conditioning, there was no equipment, there was no water pumps. There was no natural ventilation. The windows were sealed shut. Occupants had to break windows with chairs and other furniture just to get some air. There was an overwhelming stench from blocked toilets. There was no hot water to wash hands. The bottled water ran out. The heat and humidity were just overpowering. There were limited means of transport. The transport of patients and staff was unreliable. There were no elevators or ramps that were working. The lighting of the stairwells, it was total darkness. And finally, they were unable to communicate. They were unable to reach anybody outside the building to ask for help. What is a disaster, though? The eminent sociologist Quarantelli in 1987 famously said, a disaster is a social occasion. And it stems from the nature of a social system. And if we are investigating a disaster, we need to decouple the hazard or the disruption from the investigation of the social response. Far be it for me to criticize Quarantelli, but I would update what he said. I believe the lessons that have been learned from Katrina and Memorial and Sandy and Irma and Maria is that society has adapted, certainly since 1987 and even since 2005, and that we use, at least in the United States, electric power, we depend on it 24 seven. And so that has motivated me to really look at the resilience of the electric power system. So how did a civil engineer become interested in power delivery? As Professor Lowe's told you, my background is really in wind engineering. And there were a number of storms and hurricanes where the buildings were fine, but the infrastructure failed. And so the question was, why was this happening and what could we as civil engineers do about it? Willa Cather, some things you learn best in calm and others in storm. So we have here showing transmission tower failure here in Japan from a windstorm. This is from Cliff Mass, uh, a windstorm in Seattle, the distribution system. How do civil engineers view infrastructure? Well, when I was working with Stephanie Chang at UBC, we looked at a system of systems, of gray infrastructure or built systems. Electric power was probably the most important because so many of the other systems depend on electric power to function. Transportation, utilities, and so forth. Electric power, it consists of the generation here, and in, the, in the, our area, it's hydro, primarily. Then it's transmitted at very high voltage to the distribution system. So it will go through a series of substations and the voltage will be dropped. We also have power that's fairly local. This is the bullet center, and these are what we would call green infrastructure, power infrastructure, or um, solar panels on the roof. Let's look a little bit more closely again at the structures. So we have the generation, and then we have for these towers and poles, all sorts of design codes so that structures people know, oh, okay, this is what I have to do. These are the loadings for them. And in addition to that, we also have substations and the design codes for them. And that's the way that the system is built. I would note that in a line, the towers are organized as a series system or a weakest link system. And so that if you lose one tower in that line, you lose the whole line of delivery. But that's a different format from the way electrical engineers look at the system. So the ASCE also noted that there were a lot of problems with 
the reliability of the power infrastructure, and they actually gave energy in general a D plus. This is the way an electrical engineer looks at the power system. So there are diagrams here, and then you look at voltage over time. And they don't really look at the routing of the electron flow, if you will, the same way we look at it from the structural underpinnings. We want to make sure this line is fine, but to an electrical engineer, they're not really looking at that. So it becomes a little bit different in the way we look at the power system. However, there are some things that we do share in common. This is uh, Galveston Island off the coast of Texas, where we've mapped in the substations and other towers um, on this particular island. So we know exactly where the towers and the substations are. But from a civil perspective, I couldn't tell you exactly where the, how the power was flowing through there. I just know that there are lines attached to the certain substations. And of course, for the whole state of Texas, this is just the transmission line. So you can see there are many, many lines, many, many towers, et cetera, um, if you look at the state level. I began in the late 90s looking at winter storm outages because I live in Seattle. And um, if you look at this figure, that is not my attempt at doing adult coloring. That, that purple on this is Seattle, and the red denotes the, um, the, the lines of the city, the boundaries. This is basically the distribution system for Seattle City Light, or it was at the, at the time that we were investigating the storm outages for a series of storms in the late 90s. And this purple, you can see how dense that is. I mean, it's, it's a very, um, very um, fine system here in terms of the granularity. Okay. So electrical engineers, they associate customers with the distribution system. And they have these reliability indices of system average interruption, interruption outage duration, and frequency. So how many minutes has the power been out per year? How many interruptions per year, et cetera? And this is done for sort of normal reliability conditions. They're not really um, whoops, used for storm events. So for storm events, you have to do the, inf you come up with these indices and you, Rich Christie and other people in electrical engineering have then renamed them as Stady and Stafy because otherwise, if you have an outage for four days, that will completely ruin whatever your reliability indices are for the year. The civil engineering approach would be to look at restoration. We looked at the restoration curves from zero um, to 100%. That is, what part of the grid went out and how much of it was restored, how long it would take to restore it. And we fitted these um, curves to raw um, data. So this is the raw data from one of the storms. And you see it's at 100%, it goes down. This doesn't represent 100% of the entire system. Um, at that time, we were just looking at how many outages there were in a particular area. And then we would fit curves, um, mostly exponential. Um, another approach that we took at this time was to look at outage duration. So what is the probability that the duration of outages would be greater than or equal to, say, 24 hours, 48, 72, et cetera? So you think, well, why didn't you just do a nice GIS analysis? Well, <laughs> Google Earth didn't really exist then, and you weren't able to go in and do all of this lovely math. Uh, mapping. It was mostly in the realm of geography, research teams, and the military. But that changed a lot, and it's been very, very helpful to the analysis of the infrastructure. We use this data to predict where the pair crews should be located and where we should harden. That is, make them stronger physically, the poles and the towers. And that was pretty much the outcome. Uh, for earthquake analysis, we did have a lot more information that was available from USGS. So we could at least look and overlay the peak ground acceleration in G and the distribution system and then look at the outage. 
But Nisqually, in this regard, was kind of a non-event. There really were not, uh, was not that much damage. Restoration curves eventually gave way to something called quality curves. What happened? Well, there were two things that happened. One is that there were better um, geographic information systems and geography so we could look at things spatially in different levels. But also there was a major um, paper that was published, a study done by one of the um, earthquake engineering research centers, MSEER, and they defined resilience as having four dimensions robustness, rapidity, redundancy, and resourcefulness. And they came up with this curve. So it's a modified restoration curve. Here we would have 100% operation or operability quality of our system. And then it would drop to 20%. We call that the vulnerability. Um, and then it would slowly start to recover. And this became the main curve that was used by MSEER to come up with these uh, resilience dimensions. So previously people would say, oh, resilience, it's just the ability to bounce back or adapt to some situation, but there were no real metrics for it. And this um, formulation really was the first time that there were a set of measures that were very consistent. Unfortunately, resilience then became this huge popular term and it became untethered from all of these studies so then people if you do a, a search of resilience now almost everybody uses resilience in the title to their paper whether they even mention resilience or not because it's kind of a buzzword like sustainability with this Q curve here there's an area at the top called the resilience triangle and that became very popular among certain people who were looking at these quality curves for power and water and sometimes for transportation. Um, we flipped the curve because mathematically to go from zero to 80% in operability made more sense to us and also mathematically it was easier to model. So that's why we do this and we call it X of T inoperability. The resilience triangle then becomes the area underneath the curve. And one of the reasons why we didn't like this resilience triangle is that this is the triangle, the area, but you could have a system where you had almost 100% inoperability and then it would very quickly change or recover and then you would have one that was very low and take a very long time to recover. And these are two different situations, but the area under the curve is the same. And I think this was an attempt that people had because they just didn't want to deal with those four dimensions. They wanted one index to make it really, really simple and easy, but that's not what we found to be useful. The influence of the geodata. State level transmission grid maps became available through DOE or EIA. Um, parts of the government here. And this is really just the uh, transmission and doesn't include the distribution level grid, which is shown here. Also, trying to obtain statistics about outages at the state level is not really that meaningful because you could have 2 million people lose power, but if you have 50 million people in your state, it's not that important, right? It doesn't, it doesn't, really, um, it doesn't really make a big difference in the statistics. But if you have it at the neighborhood distribution level, then yes, 100% outages, that's a really big deal. And the fact that it takes a long time to recover um, as well. So the network model, so a number of people, Gian Paolo Similaro of, of MSEER, uh, Leonardo Duena Cesario of Rice, William Wallace of RPI, these are people who said, I'm going to build a network model with nodes and links and connections. And it was an attempt to sort of use some structural information, but in Leonardo's case, he really wanted to look at more of the double E type of approach of how does power move? How, does, how do electrons move from one point to the other? <clears throat> 
Um, statistical model, Seth Guy Kima, he's at Michigan, he's a systems engineer, and he would take outages and then fit models to them based on social information that he derived from the census data. For example, what's the population in this particular zip code? Was it a category one or a category two storm? Um, what's the income level? That sort of thing. And he felt that he was able to come up with a number of outages through that kind of predictive model. Um, Shafi Zada at Ohio State and Gardoni at Illinois said, well, we're going to look at the subsystems, primarily the substations, and come up with probabilities for them and fragilities for them. That is the probability of failure of a particular substation given some kind of a loading and focus on those. And our model sort of combined elements of different ones. We didn't want to look at each particular poll because we knew that if they were connected in series, you lose one, you lose the whole thing. Plus, the granularity was just kind of crazy at that time because there's so many different polls and so many different towers, et cetera, in a particular system. And we just felt that it was kind of overwhelming to go through that process just to come up with a number of outages. So we derived what we call the length of line per line or a system level um, model for this X of T. And we found that X of T could be fit by the analog of a mechanical model. So if you're in civil engineering, then you know that we have analyzed this to death, so we're very familiar with this type of model. If you're not, just know that we were trying to come up with something that made sense physically. So as an engineer, I wanted to have a model where I was looking specifically at the hazard or the loadings and also the capacity. That made sense to me. That's what I was comfortable with. And that's one of the reasons why we came up with this particular model. Anybody know which hurricane that is? I know a lot, of, a lot of people ask me to put the disaster pictures up. This is Mexico, and this is Texas, so it has to be Harvey. Um, there is more infrastructure damage, just like our Willa Catha quote, we learn a lot in storm here. This is the size, so I try to show you the size of one of these towers here. These are failures that occurred along a line, and this is wind damage, this is not water damage. This obviously is water damage. These slides were given to me by the, um, some engineers from the electrical company and uh, utility in Mexico. And this is La Paz, if you know, if you ever go down to the La Paz Peninsula on the Pacific side. So they're very wet, and you have some foundation issues there. Now that we had so much damage data and um, hazard data, and the hazard data was available through the National Hurricane um, Center, through, say, Mark Powell and others doing H-star wind, and we now had better formulations of the infrastructure then we were able to add these two together and come up with what's called a fragility function, which is the probability of damage or failure given a particular loading condition. And this is fairly fundamental to what structural engineers do. We want to know what's the probability of damage if I have a cat one or a cat two, or if I have this kind of an earthquake or that kind of an earthquake. And so it's a shorthand notation for our ability to say, OK, for this type of building or this type of system, this is what the probability of failure is. So it's a conditional probability, essentially. When we realized that this was a starting point of our curve of inoperability, so now we had an idea just based on the input loadings what this value should be, and this was very helpful in setting up our analysis and our curves. We were able to compare some of our system level values by putting together these individual fragility curves that were derived for the towers and the substations using structural engineering analysis programs, whether it was a finite element program or something else, then people said, oh, this is the way they should fail, and, but this is a single one. And so when we did combinations and series in parallel of the different components, we got something fairly close to what we were able to derive empirically using a lot of hurricane data.
But we realized, gee, hurricanes, the wind speed isn't everything. It's, there's a lot of failures caused by storm surge and by rainfall. So again, this is the state of Louisiana, the boot, and we see quite a bit of these loadings here. So what we did was we worked with Carol Friedland at LSU, and we looked at the data, and we then we played in, in MATLAB, right? So we could get some plots of inundation and uh, by storm surge, wind speed, rainfall, wind speed, and then we were also able to get some nice uh, probability density curves for various, uh, for the different variables, and then damage is plotted vertically. And we were able to use what's called a logistic regression model to come up with fragilities which had more than one um, hazard intensity. And this was very, very helpful. Um, and because all of the other components that we looked at, they were only for wind loads. And hurricanes can be very different. They're not really, the intensity is not so much the wind speed as it is the rainfall, and whether or not it just sort of come, makes landfall and then sort of parks <laughs> over Baton Rouge or New Orleans or some other place. This has a, this can, you know, can cause a great deal of damage in terms of the rainfall. After we did that, we looked at interdependency. So we had all these curves and nice fragility um, models for electric power delivery. And we said, well, let's overlay them with transportation systems and other types of utility systems. It always is not easy to come up these days, though, with a lot of infrastructure, um, GIS, uh, or mapping information, mostly because of 9-11 and security concerns. So we do the best that we can um, with the data that we have, and we use a lot of things like going on Google Earth and having to do these things by hand, which is tedious, but it is helpful to our models. We derived an input-output interdependency model, so we had basically our 11 system of systems model here that we did with Stephanie Chang. And then we had a disruption and we created interdependency coefficients. We derived them empirically between telecommunications and electric outage, for example, here. And then we were able to come up with the um, behavior of each of the infrastructure systems post event. And we really liked um, the results that we got when we went through this particular setup. So the concept ultimately was to use all of the models of electrical outages to predict outages of the other systems such as telecommunications because they used to use basically the same kind of um, distribution system wiring from one to the other. Because of this, we were asked to lead the interdependency team for this center, and it's kind of a mouthful, the risk-based community resilience planning. And the first meeting, there was a pretty large group. So we have different types of engineers and different types of social scientists and then other earth scientists put together in a room. And believe it or not, it was really hard to figure out what we were doing, because the question is, are we developing um, a program that's going to be used by social scientists or city planners or students or faculty? Who is the ultimate user? And really, what is a community? Terry McAllister is, um, was the leader of this NIST said, and this is why we have an Uncle Sam here, a community is the smallest unit that has a government. And if you have a small a government, no matter how small, what do you also have in the US? Taxes. <laughs> and if you pay taxes, there's a database. And if you pay, um, and if you have a database, then there's also a tax lot database, and it's done spatially. So it's a geo-based tax um, database. And so that, would, that was the beginning of, OK, this is a community then, um, going from the tax payers. Um, risk. So risk is here is still very sort of a classical definition, I would say. Risk 
is the consequences um, of certain hazards. So for example, it's usually expressed in terms of deaths, dollars, and downtime. So um, in many civil engineering scenarios, it has to do with how much money is lost. Um, and resilience, another thing. So here we are thinking, oh, it, we're all going to use this MSEER notation and dimensions, but that didn't go over too well because resilience, um, just because the infrastructure would be resilient, didn't mean the community would be resilient. For example, you know, you could have some horrible like Chernobyl, and the infrastructure would still be there, but there would be no community, and so. This became, so we really wanted to focus more on how the community itself, the inhabitants would be affected and what kind of measures or metrics would we use. We decided to divide into groups. So Centerville is a fictitious city in the New Madrid Fault and they looked at seismic loadings. Seaside in Oregon was tsunami and then the Galveston hurricane is the one that I was in. The major lesson that I got from um, NIST NCOR, and NCOR is the name of the series of programs that were developed there and are still under development. Um, Harvey Cutler and other people in, who were the economists for this, they used something called the computable general equilibrium model. And Harvey created these huge matrices and talked a lot about all the data that he had. And so he said, well, the local government and policy, they get tax payments and they provide services to households and they get tax payments from businesses and provide services. And these then all feeds into the regional economy. So he was focused on this particular part of the diagram. And there were expenditures going back and forth and receipt of goods and services. Basically, the metric that became the one that could be measured by this particular model, socially, were migrating households, population dislocation. So if there is a disruption and a significant part of the community left because their houses were destroyed or their businesses were destroyed, then that would affect this particular model. And so that became more or less the social metric for it. And guess what? Power outages have no effect <laughs> using this model um, for a particular region. The only way that it could have an effect is if the power were out for a year. So Puerto Rico, it would fit this model, right? Or Japan after the nuclear power disaster there would fit the model, but ours did not. But we still decided, you know, we were not gonna give up. We felt like what we were doing was important, so we continued onward. But we realized that it wasn't important in the economic model that was being used for NCORE. This is a really busy diagram of the software NCORE, and the one, two, three, four represent the parts that Stanley, who's a postdoc, um, and I were working on for this particular um, <clears throat> program. A lot of input data, and we came up with a lot of damage models, but the outcomes were really based on economic analysis. So we felt like we were making contributions, but it wasn't a direct contribution to the output there. Um, again, our input data, the, the tax parcels from Uncle Sam, we had zip code boundaries, hazard input. Um, this is Texas, and just to give you an idea, all of this data is included over here in this particular scenario. And then the output is here, and then there would be a lot of hazard statistics, time to restoration. So we felt like we could do a really good job of, for given loadings, what the outages would look like. So this, we were able to do quite a few of these, and this just represents an animation of if you have this wind speed and storm surge and this rainfall, 
this is what the damaged state looks like um, and recovery for this particular storm. So some of the issues that we had was the availability of input hazard data for the storms. Um, originally, we thought, oh, the atmospheric science people, they'll be able to give us all the hurricane data we need, and we can run the storm a thousand times, input it into our model, and come up with statistics, right? No. <laughs> it turns out that it's actually a lot more complex than that, and it takes a lot more time to create these particular models because they're so dependent upon location, whether you're going to be in Galveston, or you're in New Orleans, or you're in New York City, or you're in Miami, and there just weren't those models that were available. Um, there were some information or data that were available based on prior storms that had been set up, but it really, there weren't enough for sort of testing these particular systems for different storms. And that continues to be a real problem. I know I've talked to a number of different people about, well, maybe it's possible to go through and simulate storms and then create a, a large database, say, of the wind and the <clears throat> storm surge and the rainfall for maybe 100 different storms at each location and then use them. The other problem with that is that the landscape is changing. And these islands probably won't be there in another couple of years. I don't want to make predictions, but the landscape's changing and the weather's changing. And so this could be a real, a real issue and it would just drive up the uncertainty, but it's something that we're looking at as we continue. Um, the degree of uncertainty, I mentioned that in both the damage model and predicting the storm surge. The infrastructure itself keeps changing. When we first started with telecommunications, the cell towers were these really tall, lattice steel towers, and now they're on the roof of almost every building, right? So it's really, really hard to keep up with a particular model. Um, and these are just challenges that we'll um, continue to see. As we were going through, um, these investigations, the Puerto Rico happened with hurricane damage. So this is Irma and this is Puerto Rico. I hope you can see the outline there. So it's a lot bigger than Puerto Rico and this was before Maria. And if you look, these are concrete poles. So the concrete poles suffered this kind of damage in Irma. And if you know anything about structural engineering, there should be some bars wrapping around the longitudinal and there weren't in any of the ones that we saw here. So they did not fare well. Um, however, this had been an attempt using these poles to harden the system, to strengthen the system. I mean, a lot of attempts had been made um, in Puerto Rico and in the Gulf area to, to harden the um, towers and so forth. This was Hurricane Harvey around Houston um, the substations flooded. See, most of the, uh, of the substation area power plant, the poles were fine, the towers were fine, but the substation and the other equipment simply was not. And so you see there are guide wires here to try and strengthen this particular tower, which worked, but it didn't work against flooding. And I just felt enough already. You know, we go through each of these storms, and whether it's a winter storm or a hurricane, or in, there were a couple of earthquakes that we also looked at, but again, my, my major areas in wind engineering. Enough already, what can we do? There's something that needs to be done to the power system to just make it a lot more resilient. And then I realized it's the people stupid. <laughs> the ones in the buildings. Buckminster Fuller said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. I realized when Amy Kim joined our department and she works on energy management and efficiency um, for green buildings, 90% of our time is spent indoors, 90%. We're either in school or in work, or it doesn't seem to concern you, but 
to me, I thought, wow, 90%, that's a lot. And this is why a human-centric approach to energy management or power in buildings is so critically important. I mean, we're, we keep being told, well, it's not important, you know, buildings, oh, you know, engineers make too much about buildings, not much of a big deal, and, you know, we should be looking at the people and talking to people, et cetera, et cetera, but the people are in the buildings, right? So we have to make sure that the buildings are safe, and we also have to make sure that the infrastructure is working. So how do we do that? We flip the approach. So the existing approach says we start with the grid, and the grid goes to the community, and the community sends it to the building systems, and then it reaches the occupants. So we're at the bottom. We're at the bottom of the approach of power to people. So we said flip it. So the occupants are the most important ones, and then they decide how much power is needed in buildings, which decides you know, what part of the community will have power, and then it goes to the grid. So the important, peop, you know, the important part of this whole diagram are the occupants. We also feel like green infrastructures, which is renewables basically is what we're calling them, is also critically important. And it's critically important to us, the people, right, the inhabitants. Our infrastructure dependence is mostly electric power. We need potable water wastewater management, and we need to have telecommunications that are operating. And of these, what's most energy dependent would be thermal comfort, indoor air quality, lighting, food supply cooking, and communication. So this, we started. Now you're sick of seeing this curve, I know, but this is the grid curve. And underneath this curve in this area, these are all buildings, right? that were lost power. But from the building perspective, it's just maybe you have a little bit of a, a generator here and you, you lose 90%, but you've lost 100% of your power in a couple of hours, and then it just stays like that until the power company comes in and fixes the grid. And, and you're just sort of stuck. And we thought, gosh, what can we do? We said, well, okay, there's generation on, and if you look at solar panels, for example, it generates power, but it goes back into the grid. It's not stored. So it's not really independent of the grid. And so for net zero energy, like the bullet center, it really helps with sustainability, okay? Reducing the carbon footprint of the area. But, <clears throat> it doesn't increase the resilience. And so I find that lots of times people think that sustainability and resilience are the same thing, but they're not. They can be, but many times, particularly for energy, it's not making it more resilient because when the grid goes down, it still goes down. So we thought, okay, we created something called Building Perma Power Link, where we said if we had both the panels and the batteries, storage, that were operating continuously, then that would be resiliency. And each independent battery system would be another degree of resiliency. So we could really increase the resiliency. And so instead of looking like this, where the building's out almost the whole time and a teeny weeny bit of robustness, now we're saying, the panels that we're putting in our building will be very robust, and so most of the building will still retain some power. And you say, well, gosh, how does that happen? It happens basically through the redundancy of the energy supply. Most panel systems right now in the US do not store, they go into the grid. And even if you have the Tesla roof tiles, you're thinking, I didn't know about that, but yes, you have a whole wall of your house that's one giant battery. But even then, if the grid goes out, you're not going to be able to derive all of that power from the tiles. So it's not really providing that much resistance. So we said, well, we're gonna take each panel and attach it to 
a one kilowatt battery. And so you've got a panel, and it's got, I don't know, 300, 400 watt panel, and it's going to be able to supply power to some appliance, such as lighting, which is 17% of the amount of energy that's used in buildings. And you have a battery on the back. So we thought, OK, so we'll just make it cladding. So cladding is a term that we in structural engineering use for the covering of the building on the outside, essentially. And for this type of a building, we have something called a curtain wall. So you're basically hanging it on like a curtain. Um, and we thought, OK, we have a five foot by an eight foot panel here. And we have the battery inside. and there's glazing, so we're not going to make the whole building have this type of um, panels. And on the interior, you would have a DC and AC outlet that is connected to your one kilowatt battery. So you've got one kilowatt of power from all of these, just from that panel. So it doesn't come from the building and it doesn't come from the grid. But we were worried because these are vertical. And we thought, well, we could get a lot more um, if we use this cladding and we tilted it some. We also met with uh, Dr. Krishnan, who is a scholar in residence at the Clean Energy Center. And he is also CTO of Nant Energy, uh, which is a very large uh, battery manufacturer. And we kept going around thinking, oh, We'll just get the battery people to give us a one kilowatt battery or whatever kind of battery we wanted, you know, a bespoke battery. And he says, they don't do that. They don't do that. You always just take what's given and you put them in series and you call it a battery bank. And you have to be happy with that. They're, they're not interested in doing this kind of battery. Um, and he said, you should sell this as a civil engineering product, as a cladding. Look at it as a building issue, not as a mechanical engineering, because we were so focused on the power and the battery and so forth. So we kept going with that. These are the dimensions of the life science building that's been built here um, on campus recently. And this is the south facing wall. And we, by the time we got to version 10.0, <laughs> the, the other one was 2.0. I won't even show you 1.0. I'm too embarrassed. Um, and we've tilted it 45 degrees, and then we have this reflective cover at the bottom. These are the CADs. So you have the PV panel here that kind of slips in. The battery bank is at the back, so that when you put it on the wall, you can just find the plugs directly. Um, again, 45 degrees here. We felt a reflective material would be best here. Why? Well, if you just had the wedge, then it would create a shadow for the panel below it. And that just destroys the whole concept. So you have to have a wedge here, and then you have to figure. And if you use a mirror here, which I, somebody was doing this, I think it was in the Netherlands. Um, and we thought, oh, that's pretty cool, so we'll put that in there. And this is what the smaller batteries, and they in include inverters and all this other stuff that, um, that you need to make the system work. So we would connect this to that, put it in here. And we found that if we had about 300 of these, um, this is the back view, that it could cover probably the lighting of the building. So, Again, this is the DC power supply, and this is the interior portion of what we're calling the Beeple. And the built-in storage batteries are at the bottom here. Did it work? Well, we can go to PV Watts, if you know NREL, and they have all these programs for doing this. And this is sunrise, sunset. This is... Um, the month of the year, this is the time of day, and you will see that in July we get most of our sunlight. So this is our solar radiation plot telling us what's available. And when we used this and we said, well, okay, we went to the University of Washington Energy Dashboard, got 17% for a particular building, which is the lighting, and we looked at it over the hours of the day, and we did this particular panel for one day, so what is the future of this invention <coughs> we call Beeple, excuse me. 
On average, their 35 iterations are necessary, so we're on 20. <laughs> and today, we are <laughs> unveiling, what is this, 22? Sorry. So this is our panel. This is a reflective material. We took scrap wood from the shop, so <laughs> sorry, Laura. I don't know. Um, this is the battery here, and it just um, is placed in here. And we did test it. We put it um, outside and turned it on, and it did charge the battery. But this is obviously not the full scale. So we're, we're getting there, Steve. <laughs> um, what about risk? In our formulation, we've changed the risk to looking at buildings and the impact on providing the services and on the psychological impact. So we're not really looking at the money so much, and this is our way of looking at the risk, and that would include risk of um, associated with climate change. Because we're using renewables, and we're also looking at air quality systems. Our proposal then is to use this formulation where we have the grid going from present to 50-50, and maybe putting in a little wind turbine somewhere. And we like the fact that you can put panels, <clears throat> even if you were to connect them at each floor, because um, they're resistant to flooding at that particular point. And then it also scatters the uh, panels throughout the building, and different groups of people should have about equal power which we kind of like that particular approach as well. Um, whoops. So, and then we also looked at connecting with microgrids and other types of formulations here and coupling. Um, the other thing about having, I keep playing with this, the other thing about having this, um, the cladding and the base, et cetera, is that, um, it, it, it's also fairly resistant, I think you would say, to cyber threats. And cyber threats are kind of a big deal in terms of electric power systems. So we, we're also happy with that. Okay, that's our proposal. Acknowledgement and thanks. Professor Steve Burgess, he told me when I first came here to take the time to sit quietly and think. Don't overschedule yourself, and I think that's been a very, very good advice. The second thing, the clean version is, don't let others get you down. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Uh, the Green Dream Team, Amy Stanley, the late Yi Ming, everybody in SESI, and that includes Tim Larson and our students, others at the UW did not run away when I approached them, <laughs> so happy including Zelda Zabensky, who I know is here today, Professor John Vandalant, and then a host of other people outside the UW who have been very helpful. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.